All right, you guys, it's elevated here. Um, I really didn't think I would be back so soon. Honestly, I really didn't think I would be back doing another one of these videos again, but here we are. Um, so like I've mentioned before, I have thought about doing this too. It's kind of the same thing as my Cope series, uh, where it's basically just like a let's read or a book react. Um, However, unlike my Cope series, this is going to be like straight just reading out of the book. It's not going to be like a presentation or anything. I don't need to make it complicated like I did last time. Um, honestly, this is probably what my channel is going to turn into. I really thought, um, honestly, all I have left to do is probably just the, um, the poetry from like the last three months, uh, which I'm probably going to wait until October, November, December of this year to do. Um, but I mean, like, other than that, I really had no other plans with my channel. I did mention a couple times that I did want to do this type of video for this book. Um, so I'm going to try it out and see how it goes. Um, if it goes really well, um, I actually had a couple other books that I've been thinking about doing as well in this style. Um, we have Schopenhauer's Essays and Aphorisms, not the best Schopenhauer book to get into, it's pretty, um, scattered. It's mainly just, like, random in excerpts, um, from him, but, uh, Schopenhauer's a good, um, philosopher to get into. Uh, I also have, uh, this is actually recommended by, um, Orby, <laughs> uh, Electrodynamic Orb. Uh, the Glass Bead Game by Herman Hesch. Um, this one is pretty long. Um, and um, out of all the books that I've been considering doing this series with, um, this is the only one I haven't read yet. So it would be really nice to read this book and like do like a live react to. Um, and then I also, I'm on the fence about this one. I kind of, I'm probably going to read it again just to be sure. Uh, like I mentioned in my uh, Cope series, um, this is, uh, it's a really good concept um, just to like have in your repertoire and your toolbox or whatever. Um, having said that, from what I remember reading it last time, a lot of it's pretty unnecessary. You can probably get the gist of it in like the first two or three chapters. So if I do a book react to this, it's probably, it's most likely not going to be the whole thing. Um, just the, uh, uh, what do you call those, like cliff notes. Um, and then I know I have a smaller version of this book, but right now all I have is the big uh, version. But this is The Varieties of Religious Experience by William James, an old, uh, he was an academic, I can't remember if he was a psychologist or uh, a religious academic or something like that, but um, he did write this back in like the early 1900s, I want to say. I'm um, just talking about, and I've mentioned this on my channel before too, um, uh, where it's like, it's not necessarily like, um, the way he describes it, I think in like the first chapter is like, it's not about like the common masses, just like going to church and praying. This is about like people who have visions, people who, um, uh, 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 uh prophets or priests or people who have like a religious experience that's deeper than just like the everyday one that people normally have um and like examining it from like a uh um uh, an intellectual perspective um so yeah this is a really good one to get into i believe um also gonna be really long um actually i just remembered i haven't read this one either i think i've read like the first one or two chapters uh but yeah it would be really nice to get into um having said that oh yeah i mean apart from like books and doing that i was also thinking of doing like a geometry series um i've got this really cool book from like when was this from uh, 1943, <laughs> funnily enough, of just um, geometry problems and um, just going through and proofs and uh, like math and stuff. Um, I have started on a couple. Let me see if I can get this out. Uh, Like, there was one that actually stumped me of, like, um, constructing a line 
and then being able to divide it into an equal number of sections, um, which you can do like um, this one, for example. Uh, let me see if I can point this out real quick. Oops. I um, Honestly, I'm probably not going to get into it right now. Like I said, this is probably for, uh, for a completely separate series. Um, but yeah, it'd be nice to like just do, do geometry and stuff live um, on the channel, maybe. Yeah, I'm like a little bit iffy about doing stuff live. We might just pre-record it and upload it, but it is what it is. All right. Um, now with that hell of an introduction out of the way... We are going to go ahead and get into this. Um, before we start, I'm going to skip, like, the introduction and, like, uh, stuff like that. I'm just going to go right into chapter one. Um, but just to give you a little backstory, Milan Kundera, or Kundera, how I prefer to <laughs> pronounce it. Um, he was born in 1929, Czechoslovakia, and has been living in France. I don't know if he's still alive to this day. Probably not. 1929 is pretty old. Um... Uh, this book was written in Czech, uh, so it is a translation, um, and I mean, I'm trying to think if there's any, like, disclaimers or anything I can give about this, um, book, not that I can think of right now, we can go ahead and jump right in. Okay, so the content's pretty easy, um, each chapter, or each part is divided into, like, short, short-ish chapters, I wouldn't even call these chapters, but, like, just passages. Some of them are long, some of them aren't. Um, but yeah. Part one, lightness and weight. Part two, soul and body. Part three, words misunderstood. Part four, soul and body. Part five, lightness and weight. Part six, the grand march. And part seven, Corinne and smile. Um, yeah. Um, like I said, I don't have much of an introduction for this book other than it's going to be talking a lot about philosophy, a lot about love and romance, a lot about, like, relationships and, and life and stuff like that. <sighs> all right, having said all that, let's jump right in. I didn't like this first chapter. I think it's, uh, <laughs> it reminds me of, um, like, younger people who smoke pot and, um, try to get into, uh, deep thoughts for the first time. It just sounds like a bunch of, like, rambling of, like, people who've probably never contemplated these things before, but it gets better, I promise. Um, let's go. Uh, so the idea of eternal return is a mysterious one, and Nietzsche has often perplexed other philosophers with it. To think that everything recurs as we once experienced it, and that the recurrence itself recurs ad infinitum? What does this mad myth signify? Putting it negatively, the myth of eternal return states that a life which disappears once and for all, which does not return, is like a shadow, without weight, dead in advance. And whether it was horrible, beautiful, or sublime, its horror, sublimity, and beauty mean nothing. We need take no more note of it than of a war between two African kingdoms in the 14th century, a war that altered nothing in the destiny of the world. Even if a... Oh, wait, sorry. A war that altered nothing in the destiny of the world, even if a 100,000 blacks perished in excruciating torment. Will the war between two African kingdoms in the 14th century itself be altered if it recurs again and again in eternal return? It will. It will become a solid mass, permanently protuberant its inanity irreparable. If the French Revolution were to recur eternally, French historians would be less proud of Robespierre. But because they deal with something that will not return, the bloody years of the revolution have turned into mere words, theories, and discussions, have become lighter than feathers, frightening no one. There is an infinite difference between a Robespierre who occurs only once in history and a Robespierre who eternally returns, chopping off French heads. Let us therefore agree that the idea of eternal return implies a perspective from which things appear other than as we know them. They appear without the mitigating circumstance of their transitory nature. The, this mitigating circumstance prevents its coming... Pre, bleh, this mitigating circumstance prevents us from coming to a verdict. For how can we condemn something that is ephemeral in transit? In the sunset of dissolution, everything is illuminated by the aura of nostalgia, even the gu guillotine. 
Not long ago, I caught myself experiencing a most incredible sensation. Leafing through a book on Hitler, I was touched by some of his portraits. They reminded me of my childhood. I grew up during the war. Several members of my family perished in Hitler's concentration camps. But what were their deaths compared with the memories of a lost period in my life? A period that would never return. This reconciliation with Hitler reveals a profound moral perversity of a world that rests essentially on the non-existence of return. For in this world, everything is pardoned in advance, and therefore everything cynically permitted. If every second of our lives recurs at an infinite number of times, we are nailed to eternity as Jesus Christ was nailed to the cross. It is a terrifying prospect. In the world of eternal return, the weight of unbearable responsibility lies head heavy on every move we make. This is why Nietzsche called the idea of eternal return the heaviest of burdens. If eternal return is the heaviest of burdens, then our lives can stand out against it in all their splendid lightness. But is heaviness truly deplorable and lightness splendid? The heaviest of burdens crushes us. We sink beneath it. It pins us to the ground. But in the love poetry of every age, the woman longs to be weighed down by the man's body. The heaviest of burdens is therefore simultaneously an image of life's most intense fulfillment. The heavier the burden, the closer our lives come to the earth, the more real and fruitful, the more real and truthful they become. Conversely, the absolute absence of a burden causes man to be lighter than air, to soar into the heights, take leave of the earth and his earthly being, and become only half real his movements as free as they are insignificant. What then shall we choose, weight or lightness? Parmenides posed this very question in the 6th century before Christ. He saw the world divided into pairs of opposites, light, darkness, fineness, coarseness, warmth, cold, being, non-being. One half of the opposition he called positive, light, fineness, warmth, being, the other negative. We might find this division into positive and negative poles childishly simple except for one difficulty. Which one is positive, weight or lightness? Parmenides responded, lightness is positive, weight negative. Was he correct or not? That is the question. The only certainty is the lightness-weight opposition is the most mysterious, most ambiguous of all. I have been thinking about Tomas for many years now. But only in the light of these reflections did I see him clearly. I saw him standing at the window of his flat and looking across the courtyard at the opposite walls, not knowing what to do. He had first met Teresa about three weeks earlier in a small Czech town. They had spent scarcely an hour together. She had accompanied him to the station and waited with him until he boarded the train. Ten, year, sorry, ten days later, she paid him a visit. They made love the day she arrived. That night, she came down with a fever and stayed a whole week in his flat with the flu. He had come to feel an inexplicable love for this all but complete stranger. She seemed a child to him, a child someone had put in a bulrush basket daubed with pitch and sent downstream for Tomas to fetch at the riverbank of his bed. She stayed with him a week until she was well again, then went back to her town some 125 miles from Prague. And then came the time I have just spoken of and see as the key to his life. Standing by the window, he looked out over the courtyard at the walls opposite him and deliberated. Should he call her back to should he call her back to Prague for good? He feared the responsibility. If he invited her to come, then come she would and offer him up her life. Or should he refrain from approaching her? Then she would remain a waitress in a hotel restaurant of a provincial town and he would never see her again. Did he want her to come or did he not? He looked out over the courtyard at the opposite walls, seeking an answer. He kept recalling her lying on his bed. She reminded him of no one in his former life. She was neither mistress nor wife. She was a child whom he had taken from a bulrush basket that had been daubed with pitch and sent to the river bank of his bed. She fell asleep. He knelt down next to her. Her feverous breath quickened and she gave out a weak moan. He pressed his face to hers and whispered calming words into her sleep. After a while, he felt her breath return to normal and her face rise unconsciously to meet his. He smelled the delicate aroma of her fever and breathed it in, as if trying to glut himself with the intimacy of her body. And all at once, he fancied she had been with him for many years and was dying. 
He had a sudden clear feeling that he would not survive her death. He would lie down beside her and want to die with her. He pressed his face into the pillow beside her head and kept it there for a long time. Now he was standing at the window trying to call that moment to account. What could it have been if not love declaring itself to him? But was it love? The feeling of wanting to die beside her was clearly exaggerated. He had seen her only once before in his life. Was it simply the hysteria of a man who, aware deep down of his inaptitude for love, felt the self-deluding need to simulate it? His unconscious was so cowardly that the best partner it could choose for its little comedy was this miserable provincial waitress with practically no chance at all to enter his life. Looking out over the courtyard at the dirty walls, he realized he had no idea whether it was hysteria or love. Um, and he was distressed that in a situation where a real man would instantly have known how to act, he was vacillating and therefore depriving the most beautiful moments he had ever experienced, kneeling at her bed and thinking he would not survive her death, of their meaning. He remained annoyed with himself until he realized that not knowing what he wanted was actually quite natural. We can never know what to want because, living only one life, we can neither compare it with our previous lives nor perfect it in our lives to come. Was it better to be with Teresa or to remain alone? There is no means of testing which decision is better because there is no basis for comparison. We live everything as it comes, without warning, like an actor going on cold. And what can life be worth if the first rehearsal for life is life itself? That is why life is always like a sketch. No, sketch is not quite the word, because a sketch is an outline of something, the groundwork for a picture, whereas the sketch that is our life is a sketch for nothing, an outline with no picture. Einmal ist kein Mal, says Thomas to himself. What happens but once, says the German adage, might as well not have happened at all. If we have only one life to live, we might as well not have lived at all. But then one day at the hospital, during a break between operations, a nurse called him to the telephone. He heard Teresa's voice coming from the receiver. She had phoned him from the railway station. He was overjoyed. Unfortunately, he had something gone that evening and could not invite her to his place until the next day. The moment he hung up, he reproached himself for not letting her for not telling her to go straight there. He had time enough to cancel his plans, after all. He tried to imagine what Teresa would do in Prague during the 36 long hours before they were to meet, and had half a mind to jump in his car and drive through the streets looking for her. She arrived the next evening, a handbag dangling from her shoulder, looking more elegant than before. She had a thick book under her arm. It was Anna Karenina, she seemed in a good mood, even a little boisterous, and tried to make him think she had just happened to drop in. Things had just worked out that way. She was in Prague on business, perhaps. At this point, she became rather vague to find a job. Later, as they lay naked and spent side by side on the bed, he asked her whether she was staying. It was night by then, and he offered to drive her there. Embarrassed, she answered that she still had to find a hotel and had left her suitcase at the station. Only two days ago, he had feared that if he invited her to Prague, she would offer him up her life. When she told him her suitcase was at the station, he immediately realized that the suitcase contained her life and that she had left it at the station only until she could offer it up to him. The two of them got into his car, which was parked in front of the house, and drove to the station. There, he claimed the suitcase. The suitcase. It was large and enormously heavy, and took it and her home. How had he come to make such a sudden decision when for nearly a fortnight he had wavered so much that he could not even bring himself to send a postcard asking her how she was? He himself was surprised. He had acted against his principles. Ten years earlier, when he had divorced his wife, he celebrated the event the way others celebrate a marriage. He understood he was not born to live side by side with any woman and could be fully himself only as a bachelor. He tried to design his life in such a way that no woman could move in with a suitcase. That was why his flat had only the one bed. Even though it was wide enough, Thomas would tell his mistresses that he was unable to fall asleep with anyone next to him and drive them home after midnight. And so, it was not the flu that kept him from sleeping with Therese on her first visit. The first night, he had slept in his large armchair, and the rest of that week he drove each night to the hospital, where he had a cot in his office. 
but this time he fell asleep by her side. When he woke up the next morning, he found Teresa, who was still asleep, holding his hand. Could they have been hand in hand all night? It was hard to believe. And while she breathed a deep breath of sleep and held his hand firmly, he was unable to disengage it from her grip. The enormously heavy suitcase stood by the bed. He refrained from loosening his hand from her grip for fear of waking her, and turned carefully on his side to observe her better. Again, it occurred to him that Teresa was a child put in a pitch daubed bulrush basket and sent downstream. He couldn't very well let a basket with a child in it float down a stormy river. If the pharaoh's daughter hadn't snatched the basket carrying little Moses from the waves, there would have been no Old Testament, no civilization as we know it. How many ancient myths begin with the rescue of an abandoned child? If Polybus hadn't taken in the young Oedipus, Sophocles wouldn't have written his most beautiful tragedy. Tomas did not realize at that time that metaphors are dangerous. Metaphors are not to be trifled with. A single metaphor can give birth to love. He lived a scant two years with his wife, and they had a son. At the divorce proceedings, the judge awarded the infant to its mother and ordered Tomas to pay a third of his salary for its support. He also granted him the right to visit the boy every other week. But each time Tomas was supposed to see him, the boy's mother found an excuse to keep him away. He soon realized that bringing them expensive gifts would make things a good deal easier, that he was expected to bribe the mother for the son's love. He saw a future of quixotic attempts to inculcate his views in the boy, views opposed in every way to the mother's, the very thought of it exhausted him. When, one Sunday, the boy's, mother the boy's mother again canceled a scheduled visit, Tomas decided on the spur of the moment never to see him again. Why should he feel more for that child, to whom he was bound by nothing but a single improvident night, than for any other? He would be scrupulous about paying support. He just didn't want anybody making him fight for his son in the name of paternal sentiments. Needless to say, he found no sympathizers. His own parents condemned him roundly. If Tomas refused to take an interest in his son, then they, Tomas's parents, would no longer take an interest in theirs. They made a great show of maintaining good relations with their daughter-in-law and trumpeted their exemplary stance and sense of justice. Thus, in practically no time, he managed to rid himself of wife, son, mother, and father. The only thing they bequeathed to him was a fear of women. Tomas desired but feared them. Needing to create a compromise between fear and desire, he devised what he called erotic friendship. He would tell his mistresses, the only relationship that can make both partners happy is one in which sentimentality has no place and neither partner makes any claim on the life and freedom of the other. To ensure that erotic friendship never grew into the aggression of love, he would meet each of his long-term mistresses only at intervals. He considered this method flawless and propagated it among his friends. The important thing is to abide by the rule of threes. Either you see a woman three times in quick succession, three times in quick succession and then never again, or you maintain relations over the years to make sure that the, rendez that the rendezvous are at least three weeks apart. The rule of threes enabled Tomas to keep intact his liaisons with some women while continuing to engage in short-term affairs with many other others. He was not always understood. The woman who understood him best was Sabina. She was a painter. The reason I like you, she would say to him, is you're the complete opposite of Kitsch. In the kingdom of Kitsch, you would be a monster. It was Sabina he turned to when he needed to find a job for Teresa in Prague. Following the unwritten rules of erotic friendship, Sabina promised to do everything in her power. And before long, she had in fact located a place for Teresa in the dark room of an illustrated weekly. Although her new job did not require any particular qualifications, it raised her status from waitress to a member of the press. When Sabina herself introduced Teresa to everyone on the weekly, Tomas knew he had never had a better friend as a mistress than Sabina. The unwritten contract of erotic friendship stipulated that Thomas should exclude all love from his life. The moment he violated that clause of the contract, his other mistresses would assume inferior status and become ripe for insurrection. Accordingly, he rented a room for Teresa and her heavy suitcase. He wanted to be able to watch over her, protect her, enjoy her presence, but felt no need to change his way of life. 
He did not want word to get out that Teresa was sleeping at his place. Spending the night together was the corpus delecti of love. He never spent the night with the others. It was easy enough if he was at their place. He could leave whenever he pleased. It was worse when they were at his, and he had to explain that come midnight he would have to drive them home because he was an insomniac and found it impossible to fall asleep in close proximity to another person. Though it was not far from the truth, he never dared to tell them the whole truth. After making love, he had an uncontrollable craving to be by himself. Waking in the middle of the night at the sight of an alien body was distasteful to him, rising in the morning with an intruder repellent. He had no desire to be overheard brushing his teeth in the bathroom, nor was he enticed by the thought of an intimate breakfast. That is why he was so surprised to wake up and find Teresa squeezing his hand tightly. Lying there looking at her, he could not quite understand what had happened. But as he ran through the previous few hours in his mind, he began to sense an aura of hitherto unknown happiness emanating from them. From that time on, they both looked forward to sleeping together. I might even say that the goal of their lovemaking was not so much pleasure as the sleep that followed it. She especially was affected. Whenever she stayed overnight in her rented room, which quickly became only an alibi for Thomas, she was unable to fall asleep. In his arms, she would fall asleep no matter how wrought up she might have been. He would whisper impromptu fairy tales about her, or gibberish, words he repeated monotonously, words soothing or comical, which turned into vague visions lulling her through the first dreams of the night. He had complete control over her sleep. She dozed off at the second he chose. While they slept, she held to him as on the first night, keeping a firm grip on the wrist, finger, or ankle. If he wanted to move without waking her, he had to resort to artifice. After, freezing, after freeing his finger, wrist, or ankle from her clutches, a process which, since she guarded him carefully even in her sleep, never failed to arouse her partially, he would calm her by slipping an object into her hand, a rolled-up pajama top, a slipper, a book, which she then gripped as tightly as if it were part of his body. Once, when he had just lulled her to sleep, but she had gone no farther than James' antechamber and was therefore still responsive, responsive to him, he said to her, Goodbye, I'm going now. Where? she asked in her sleep. Away, he answered sternly. Then I'm going with you, she said, sitting up in bed. No, you can't. I'm going away for good, he said, going out into the hall. She stood up and followed him out, squinting. She was naked beneath her short nightdress. Her face was blank, expressionless, but she moved energetically. He walked through the hall of the flat into the hall of the building, the hall shared by all the occupants, closing the door in her face. She flung it open and continued to follow him, convinced in her sleep that he meant to leave her for good and she had to stop him. He walked down the stairs to the first landing and waited for her there. She went down after him, took him by the hand, and led him back to bed. Tomas came to this conclusion. Making love with a woman and sleeping with a woman are two separate passions, not merely different, but opposite. Love does not make itself felt in the desire for copulation, a desire that extends to an infinite number of women, but in the desire for shared sleep, a desire limited to one woman. Just a sec. In the middle of the night, she started moaning in her sleep. Tomas woke her up, but when she saw his face, she said, with hatred in her voice, Get away from me! Get away from me! Then she told him her dream. The two of them and Sabina had been in a big room together. There was a bed in the middle of the room. It was like a platform in the theater. Tomas ordered her to stand in the corner while he made love to Sabina. The sight of it caused Teresa intolerable suffering. Hoping to alleviate the pain in her heart by pains of the flesh, she jabbed needles under her fingernails. It hurt so much, she said, squeezing her hands into fists as if they, were, as if they actually were wounded. He pressed her to him, and she gradually, trembling violently for a long time, fell asleep in his arms. Thinking about the dream the next day, he remembered something. He opened a desk drawer and took out a packet of letters Sabina had written to him. He was not long in finding the following passage. I want to make love to you in my studio. 
It will be like a stage surrounded by people. The audience won't be allowed up close, but they won't be able to take their eyes off of us. The worst of it was that the letter was dated. It was quite recent, written long after Teresa had moved in with Tomas. So you've been rummaging in my letters. She did not deny it. Throw me out then. But he did not throw her out. He could picture her pressed against the wall of Sabina's studio, jam jabbing needles up under her nails. He took her fingers between his hands and stroked them, brought them to his lips and kissed them, as if they still had drops of blood on them. But from that time on, everything seemed to conspire against him. Not a day went by without her learning something about his secret life. At first, he denied it all. Then, when the evidence became too blatant, he argued that his polygamous way of life did not in the least run counter to his love for her. He was inconsistent. First he disavowed his infidelities, then he tried to justify them. Once he was saying goodbye, once he was saying goodbye after making a date with a woman on the phone, when from the next room came a strange sound like the chattering of teeth. By chance, she had come home without his realizing it. She was pouring something from a medicine bottle down her throat, and her hand shook so badly the glass bottle clicked against her teeth. He pounced on her as if trying to save her from drowning. The bottle fell to the floor, spotting the carpet with valerian drops. She put up a good fight, and he had to keep her in a straitjacket-like hold for a quarter of an hour before he could calm her. He knew he was in an unjustifiable situation, based as it was on complete inequality. One evening, before she discovered his correspondence with Sabina, they had gone to a bar with some friends to celebrate Teresa's new job. She had been promoted at the weekly from darkroom technician to staff photographer. Because he had never been much for dancing, one of his younger colleagues took over. They made a splendid couple on the dance floor, and Tomas found her more beautiful than ever. He looked on in amazement at the split-second position and deference with which Teresa anticipated her partner's will. The dance seemed to him a declaration that her devotion, her ardent desire to satisfy his every whim, was not necessarily bound to his person. That if she hadn't met Thomas, she would have been ready to respond to the call of any other man she might have met instead. He had no difficulty imagining Teresa and his young colleague as lovers. And the ease with which he arrived at this fiction wounded him. He realized that Teresa's body was perfectly thinkable coupled with any male bottle, body, and the thought put him in a foul mood. Not until late that night, at home, did he admit to her that he was jealous. This absurd jealousy, grounded as it was in mere hypotheses, proved that he considered her fidelity an unconditional postulate of their relationship. How then could he begrudge her? How then could he begrudge her her jealousy of his very real mistresses? During the day, she tried, though only with partial success, to believe what Thomas told her and to be cheerful as she had been before. But her jealousy, thus tamed by day, burst forth all the more savagely in her dreams, each of which ended in a wail he could silence only by waking her. Her dreams recurred like themes and variations or television series. For example, she repeatedly dreamed of cats jumping at her face and digging their claws into her skin. We need not look far for an interpretation. In Czech slang, the word cat means a pretty woman. Teresa saw herself threatened by women, all women. All women were potential mistresses for Tomas, and she feared them all. In another cycle, she was being sent to her death. Once, when he woke her as she screamed in terror in the dead of the night, she told him about it. I was at a large indoor swimming pool. There were about 20 of us all women. We were naked and had to march around the pool. There was a basket hanging from the ceiling and a man standing in the basket. The man wore a broad-brimmed hat shading his face, but I could see it was you. You kept giving us orders, shouting at us. We had to sing as we marched, sing and do knee bends. If one of us did a bad knee bend, you would shoot her with a pistol and she would fall dead in the pool, which made everybody laugh and sing even louder. You never took your eyes off us, and the minute we did something wrong, you would shoot. The pool was full of corpses floating just below the surface, and I knew I lacked the strength to do the next knee bend, and you were going to shoot me. 
In a third cycle, she was dead. Lying in a hearse as big as a furniture van, she was surrounded by dead women. There were so many of them that the back door would not close and several legs dangled out. But I'm not dead, Teresa cried. I can still feel. So can we, the corpses laughed. They laughed the same laugh as the live woman who used to tell her cheerfully it was perfectly normal that one day she would have bad teeth, faulty ovaries, and wrinkles. Because they all had bad teeth, faulty ovaries, and wrinkles. Laughing the same laugh, they told her that she was dead and it was perfectly all right. Suddenly, she felt a need to urinate. You see, she cried, I need to pee. That's positive proof I'm not dead. But they only laughed again. Needing to pee is perfectly normal, they said. You'll go on feeling that kind of thing for a long time yet. Like a person who has an arm cut off and keeps feeling it's there. We may not have a drop of pee left in us, but we keep needing to pee. Teresa huddled to against Thomas in bed. And the way they talked to me, like old friends, people who'd known me forever. I was appalled at the thought of having to stay with them forever. All languages that derive from Latin form the word compassion by combining the prefix meaning with, calm, and the root meaning suffering, late Latin, passio. In other languages, Czech, Polish, German, and Swedish, for instance, this word is translated by a noun formed of an equivalent prefix combined with the word that means feeling. Czech, susi, Polish, something, something, German, mitgefühl, and Swedish, medkansla. In languages that derive from Latin, compassion means we cannot look on coolly as others suffer, or we sympathize with those who suffer. Another word with approximately the same meaning, pity, French pitié, Italian pietà, etc., connotes a certain condescension towards the sufferer. To take pity on a woman means that we are better off than she, that we stoop to her level, lower ourselves. That is why the word compassion generally inspires suspicion. It designates what is considered an inferior, second-rate sentiment that has little to do with love. To love someone out of compassion means not really to love. In languages that form the word compassion not from the root suffering but from the root feeling, the word is used in approximately the same way, but to contend that it designates a bad or inferior sentiment is difficult. The secret strength of its etymology floods the word with another light and gives it a broader meaning. To have compassion, or co-feeling, means not only to be able to live with the other's misfortune, but also to feel with him any emotion. Joy, anxiety, happiness, pain. This kind of compassion, in the sense of susit, something something, mitgetful metkansla, therefore signifies the maximal capacity of effective imagination the art of emotional telepathy. In the hierarchy of sentiments, then, it is supreme. By revealing to Tomas her dream about jabbing needles under her fingernails, Teresa unwittingly revealed that she had gone through his desk. If Teresa had been any other woman, Tomas would never have spoken to her again. Aware of that, Teresa said to him, throw me out. But instead of throwing her out, he seized her hand and kissed the tips of her fingers, because at that moment he himself felt the pain under her fingernails as surely as if the nerves of her fingers led straight to his own brain. Anyone who has failed to benefit from the devil's gift of compassion, co-feeling, will condemn Teresa coldly for her deed, because privacy is a sacred and drawers containing intimate correspondence are not to be opened. But because compassion was Tomas's fate, or curse, he felt that he himself had knelt before the open desk drawer, unable to tear his eyes from Sabina's letter. He understood Teresa, and not only was he incapable of being angry with her, he loved her all the more. Her gestures grew abrupt and unsteady. Two years had elapsed since she discovered he was unfaithful, and things had grown worse. There was no way out. Was he genuinely incapable of abandoning his erotic friendships? He was. It would have torn him apart. He lacked the strength to control his taste for other women. Besides, he failed to see the need. No one knew better than he how little his exploits threatened Teresa. Why then give them up? 
he saw no more reason for that than to deny himself soccer matches. But was it still a matter of pleasure? Even as he set out to visit another woman, he found her distasteful and promised himself he would not see her again. <clears throat> he constantly had Teresa's image before his eyes, and the only way he could erase it was by quickly getting drunk. Ever since meeting Teresa, he had been unable to make love to other women without alcohol. But alcohol on his breath was a sure sign to Teresa of infidelity. <clears throat> he was caught in a trap. Even on his way to see them, he found them distasteful. But one day without them and he was back on the phone, eager to make contact. He still felt most comfortable with Sabina. He knew she was discreet and would not divulge their rendezvous. Her studio greeted him like a memento of his past, his idyllic bachelor past. Perhaps he himself did not realize how much he had changed. He was now afraid to come home late because Teresa would be waiting up for him. Then one day, Sabina caught him glancing at his watch during intercourse and trying to hasten its conclusion. Afterwards, still naked and lazily walking around the studio, she stopped before an easel with a half-finished painting and watched him sidelong as he threw on his clothes. When he was fully dressed except for one bare foot, he looked around the room and then got down on all fours to continue the search under a table. You seem to be turning into the theme of all my paintings, she said. The meeting of two worlds, a double exposure. Showing through the outline of Tomas the Libertine, incredibly, the face of a romantic lover. Or, the other way, through a Tristan, always thinking of his Teresa, I see the beautiful, betrayed worlds of the Libertine. Tomas straightened up and, distractedly, listened to Sabina's words. What are you looking for? she asked. A sock. She searched all over the room with him, and again he got down on all fours to look under the table. Your sock isn't anywhere to be seen, said Sabina. You must have come without it. How could I have come without it, cried Tomas, looking at his watch. I wasn't wearing only one sock when I came, was I? It's not out of the question. You've been very absent-minded lately. Always rushing somewhere, looking at your watch. It wouldn't surprise me in the least if you forgot to put on a sock. He was just about to put his shoe on his bare foot. It's cold out, Sabina said. I'll lend you one of my stockings. She handed him a long, white, fashionable, wide net stocking. He knew very well she was getting back at him for glancing at his watch while making love to her. She had hidden his sock somewhere. It was indeed cold out and he had no choice but to take her up on the offer. He went home wearing a sock on one foot and a wide net stocking rolled down over his ankle on the other. He was in a bind. In his mistress's eyes, he bore the stigma of his love for Teresa. In Teresa's eyes, the stigma of his exploits with the mistresses. To assuage Teresa's sufferings, he married her. They could finally give up the room, which she had not lived in for quite some time, and gave her a puppy. It was born to a St. Bernard owned by a colleague. The sire was a neighbor's German shepherd. No one wanted the little mongrels, and his colleague was loath to kill them. Looking over the puppies, Tomas knew that the ones he rejected would have to die. He felt like the President of the Republic standing before four prisoners condemned to death and empowered to pardon only one of them. At last, he made his choice, a bitch whose body seemed reminiscent of the German Shepherd and whose head belonged to its St. Bernard mother. He took it home to Teresa, who picked it up and pressed it to her breast. The puppy immediately peed on her blouse. Then they tried to come up with a name for it. Tomas wanted the name to be a clear indication that the dog was Teresa's, and he thought of the book she was clutching under her arm when she arrived unannounced in Prague. He suggested that they call the puppy Tolstoy. It can't be Tolstoy, Teresa said. It's a girl. How about Anna Karenina? It can't be Anna Karenina, said Thomas. No woman could possibly have so funny a face. It's much more like a Karenin. Yes, Anna's husband. That's just how I've always pictured him. But won't calling her Karenin affect her sexuality? It is entirely possible, said Tomas, that a female dog addressed continually by a male name will develop lesbian tendencies. Strangely enough, Tomas's words came true, though bitches are usually more affectionate to their masters than to their mistresses. Karenin pr proved it. I don't know why that's a 
period right there. Though bitches are usually more affectionate to their masters than to their mistresses, Karenin proved an exception, deciding that he was in love with Teresa. Tomas was grateful to him for it. He would stroke the puppy's head and say, well done, Karenin, that's just what I wanted for you. Since I can't cope with her by myself, you must help me. But even with Karenin's help, Tomas failed to make her happy. He became aware of his failure some years later, on approximately the 10th day after his country was occupied by Russian tanks. It was August 1968, and Tomas was receiving daily phone calls from a hospital in Zurich. The director there, a physician who had struck up a friendship with Tomas at an international conference, was worried about him and kept offering him a job. I'm just trying to see how much longer we have. Uh, yeah, we can probably make it through. I just gotta put, um, charge my phone real quick. Okay. All right. If Tomas rejected the Swiss doctor's offer without a second thought, it was for Teresa's sake. He assumed she would not want to leave. She had spent the whole first week of the occupation in a kind of trance, almost resembling happiness. After roaming the streets with her camera, she would hand the rolls of film to foreign journalists, who actually fought over them. Once, when she went too far and took a close-up of an officer pointing his revolver at a group of people, she was arrested and kept overnight at a Russian military headquarters. There, they threatened to shoot her, but no sooner did they let her go than she was back in the streets with her camera. That is why Tomas was surprised when on the 10th day of the occupation, she said to him, why is it you don't want to go to Switzerland? Why should I? They can make it hard for you here. They can make it hard for anybody, replied Thomas with a wave of the hand. What about you? Could you live abroad? Why not? You've been out there risking your life for this country. How can you be, known, how can you be so nonchalant about leaving it? Now that Dushek is back, things have changed, said Teresa. It was true. The general euphoria lasted no longer than the first week. The representatives of the country had been hauled away like criminals by the Russian army. No one knew where they were. Everyone feared for the men's lives, and hatred for the Russians drugged people like alcohol. It was a drunken carnival of hate. Czech towns were decorated with thousands of hand-painted posters bearing ironic texts, epigrams, poems, and cartoons of Brezhnev and his shoulders, soldiers, jeered at by one and all as a circus of illiterates. But no carnival can go on forever. In the meantime, the Russians had forced the Czech representatives to sign a compromise agreement in Moscow. When Dushek returned to them to Prague, he gave a speech over the radio. He was so devastated after his six-day detention he could hardly talk. He kept stuttering and gasping for breath, making long pauses between sentences, pauses lasting nearly 30 seconds. The compromise saved the country from the worst. The executions and the mass deportations to Siberia that had terrified everyone. But one thing was clear. The country would have to bow to the conqueror. Forever and ever it will stutter, stammer, gasp for air like Alexander Dubček. The carnival was over. Work-a-day work humiliation had begun. Teresa had explained all this to Tomas, and he knew that it was true. But he also knew that underneath it all hid still another, more fundamental truth, the reason why she wanted to leave Prague. She had never really been happy before. The days she walked th through the streets of Prague, taking pictures of the Russian soldiers and looking danger in the face were the best of her life. They were the only time when the television series of her dreams had been interrupted and she had enjoyed a few happy nights. The Russians had brought equilibrium to her in their tanks and, now that the carnival was over, she feared her nights again and wanted to escape them. She now knew there were conditions under which she could feel strong and fulfilled, and she longed to go off into the world and seek those conditions somewhere else. It doesn't bother you that Sabina has also emigrated to Switzerland? Tomas asked. Geneva is in Zurich, said Teresa. She'll be much less of a difficulty there than she was in Prague. A person who longs to leave the place where he lives is an unhappy person. That is why Tomas accepted Teresa's wish to emigrate as a culprit accepts his sentence. And one day he and Teresa and Karenin found themselves in the largest city in Switzerland. He bought a bed for their empty flat, 
they had no money yet for other furniture, and threw himself into his work with the frenzy of a man of 40 beginning a new life. He made several telephone calls to Geneva. A show of Sabina's work had opened there by chance a week after the Russian invasion, and in a wave of sympathy for her tiny country, Geneva's patrons of the arts bought up all of her paintings. Thanks to the Russians, I'm a rich woman, she said, laughing in the telephone. She invited Tomas to come and see her new studio, and assured him it did not differ greatly from the one he had known in Prague. He would have been only too glad to visit her, but was unable to find an excuse to explain his absence to Teresa. And so Sabina came to Zurich. She stayed at a hotel. Tomas went to see her after work. He phoned first from the reception desk, then went upstairs. When she opened the door, she stood before him on her beautiful long legs wearing nothing but panties and a bra and a black bowler hat. She stood there staring, mute and motionless. Tomas did the same. Suddenly he realized how touched he was. He removed the bowler from her head and placed it on the bedside table. Then they made love without saying a word. Leaving the hotel for his flat, which by now had acquired table, chairs, couch, and carpet, he thought happily that he carried his way of living with him as a snail carries his house. Teresa and Sabina represented the two poles of his life, separate and irreconcilable, yet equally appealing. But the fact that he carried his life support system with him everywhere like a part of his body meant that Teresa went on having dreams. They had been in Zurich for six or seven months when he came home late one evening to find a letter on the table telling him she had left for Prague. She had left because she lacked the strength to live abroad. She knew she was supposed to bolster him up, but did not know how to go about it. She had been silly enough to think that going abroad would change her. She thought that after what she had been through during the invasion, she would stop being petty and grow up, grow wise and strong. But she had overestimated herself. She was weighing him down and would do so no longer. She had drawn the necessary conclusions before it was too late. And she apologized for taking Corinne in with her. He took some sleeping pills, but did, still did not close his eyes until morning. Luckily, it was Saturday and he could stay at home. For the 150th time, he went over the situation. The borders between his country and the rest of the world were no longer open. No telegrams or telephone calls could bring her back. The authorities would never let her travel abroad. Her departure was staggeringly definitive. Second one. The realization that he was utterly powerless was like the blow of a sledgehammer, yet it was curiously calming as well. No one was forcing him into a decision. He felt no need to stare at the walls of the house across the courtyard and ponder whether to live with her or not. Teresa had made the decision herself. He went to a restaurant for lunch. He was depressed, but as he ate, his original de desperation waned, lost its strength, and soon all that was left was melancholy. Looking back on the years he had spent with her, he came to feel that their story could have had no better ending. If someone had invented this story, this is how he would have had to end it. One day, Teresa came to him uninvited. One day, she left the same way. She came with a heavy suitcase. She left with a heavy suitcase. He paid the bill, left the restaurant, and started walking through the streets, his melancholy growing more and more beautiful. He had spent seven years of his life with Teresa, and now he realized that those years were more attractive in retrospect than they were when he was living them. His love for Teresa was beautiful, but it was also tiring. He had constantly had to hide things from her, sham, dissemble, make amends, buck her up, calm her down, give her evidence of his feelings, play the defendants to her jealousy, her suffering, and her dreams, feel guilty, make excuses, and apologies. Now what was tiring had disappeared and only the beauty remained. Saturday found him for the first time strolling alone through Zurich, breathing in the heady smell of his freedom. New adventures hid around each corner. The future was again a secret. He was on his way back to the bachelor life, the life he had once felt destined for, the life that would let him be what he actually was. For seven years he had lived bound to her, his every step subject to her scrutiny. She might as well have chained iron balls to his ankles. Suddenly, his step was much lighter. He soared. 
he had entered Parmenides' magic field. He was enjoying the sweet lightness of being. Did he feel like phoning Sabina in Geneva? Contacting one or another of the women he had met during his several months in Zurich? No, not in the least. Perhaps he sensed that any woman would make his memory of Teresa unbearably painful. The curious, melancholic fascination lasted until Sunday evening. On Monday, everything changed. Teresa forced her way into his thoughts. He imagined her sitting there writing her farewell letter. He felt her hands trembling. He saw her lugging her heavy, heavy uh, he saw her lugging her heavy suitcase in one hand and leading her in and on his leash with the other. He pictured her unlocking their prog flat and suffered the utter abandonment, breathing her in the face as she opened the door. During those two beautiful days of melancholy, his compassion, that curse of emotional telepathy, had taken a holiday. It had slept the sound Sunday sleep of a miner who, after a hard week's work, needs to gather strength for his Monday shift. Instead of the patients he was treating, Tomas saw Teresa. He tried to remind himself, don't think about her, don't think about her. He said to himself, I'm sick with compassion. It's good that she's gone and I'll never see her again, though it's not Teresa I need to be free of. It's that sickness, compassion, which I thought I was immune to until she infected me with it. On Saturday and Sunday, he felt the sweet lightness of being rise up to him out of the depths of the future. On Monday, he was hit by a weight the likes of which he had never known. The tons of steel of the Russian tanks were nothing compared with it, for there is nothing heavier than compassion. Not even one's own pain weighs so heavily as the pain one feels with someone, for someone, a pain intensified by the imagination and prolonged by a hundred echoes. He kept warning himself not to give in to compassion, and compassion listened with bowed head and a seemingly guilty conscience. Compassion knew it was being presumptuous, yet it quietly stood its ground, and on the fifth day after her departure, Tomas informed the director of his hospital, the man who had phoned him daily in Prague after the Russian invasion, that he had to return at once. He was ashamed. He knew that the move would appear irresponsible and excusable to the man. He thought to unbosom himself and tell the story of Teresa and the letter she had left on the table for him. But in the end, he did not. From the Swiss doctor's point of view, Teresa's move could only appear hysterical and abhorrent, and Tomas refused to allow anyone an opportunity to think ill of her. The director of the hospital was, in fact, offended. Tomas shrugged his shoulders and said, Es muss sein, es muss sein. It was an illusion. The last of movement of Beethoven's last quartet is based on the following two motifs. Must es sein, es must sein, es must sein. And in English, uh, must it be, it must be, it must be. Uh, to make the meaning of the words absolutely clear, Beethoven introduced the movement with the phrase der Schwer gefasst and Schulz, which is commonly translated as the difficult resolution. This allusion to Beethoven was actually Tomas's first step back to Teresa, because she was the only one who had induced him to buy records of the Beethoven quartets and sonatas. Excuse me. The allusion was even more pertinent than he had thought because the Swiss doctor was a great music lover. Smiling serenely, he asked in the melody of Beethoven's motif, Muss sein? Ja, es muss sein, Tomas, Tomas said again. Unlike Parmenides, Beethoven apparently viewed weight as something positive. Since the German word schwer means both difficult and heavy, Beethoven's difficult resolution may be construed as a heavy or weighty resolution. The weighty resolution is at one with the voice of fate, es muss sein. Necessity, weight, and value are three concepts inextricably bound. Only necessity is heavy, and only what is heavy has value. This is a conviction born of Beethoven's music, and although we cannot ignore the possibility, or even probability, that it owes its origins more to Beethoven's commentators than to Beethoven himself, we all more or less share it. 
We believe that the greatness of man stems from the fact that he bears his fate as Atlas bore the heavens on his shoulders. Beethoven's hero is a lifter of metaphysical weights. Tomas approached the Swiss border. I imagine a gloomy, shock-headed Beethoven, in person, conducting the local fireman's brass band in a farewell to emigration, an endless sign march. Then Tomas crossed the Czech border and was welcomed by columns of Russian tanks. He had to stop his car and wait half an hour before they passed. A terrifying soldier in black uniform of the armored forces stood out at the crossroads directing traffic as if every road in the country belonged to him and him alone. Es muss sein, Thomas repeated to himself, but then he began to doubt. Did it really have to be? Yes, it was unbearable for him to stay in Zurich, imagining Teresa living on her own in Prague. But how long would he have been tortured by compassion? All his life? A year? Or a month? Or only a week? How could he have known? How could he have gauged it? Any schoolboy can do experiments in the physics lab to test various scientific hypotheses. But man, because he has only one life to live, cannot conduct experiments to test whether to follow his passion, compassion, or not. It was with these thoughts in mind that he opened the door to his flat. Karenin made the homecoming easier by jumping up on him and licking his face. The desire to fall into Teresa's arms, he could still feel it while getting in his car in Zurich, had completely disintegrated. He fancied himself standing opposite her in the midst of a snowy plain, the two of them shivering from the cold. From the very beginning of the occupation, Russian military aeroplanes had flown over Prague all night long. Tomas, no longer accustomed to the noise, was unable to fall asleep. Twisting and turning beside the slumbering Teresa, he recalled something she had told him a long time before in the course of an insignificant conversation. They had been talking about his friend Z. When she announced, if I hadn't met you, I'd certainly have fallen in love with him. Even then, her words had left Tomas in a strange state of melancholy, and now he realized it was only a matter of chance that Teresa loved him and not his friend Z. Apart from her consummated love for Tomas, uh, there was not. Uh, apart from her consummated love for Tomas, there was in the realm of possibility an infinite number of unconsummated loves for other men. We all reject, out of hand, the idea that the lover of our life may be something light or weightless. We presume our love is what must be, that without it, our life would no longer be the same. We feel that Beethoven himself, gloomy and awe-inspiring, is playing the esmus sign to our own great love. Tomas often thought of Teresa's remark about his friend Z, and came to the conclusion that the love story of his life exemplified not esmus sign, it must be so, but rather... Es konnte auch anders sein. It could just as well be otherwise. Seven years earlier, a complex neurological case happened to have been discovered at the hospital in Teresa's town. They called in the chief surgeon of Tomas's hospital in Prague for consultation, but the chief surgeon of Tomas's hospital happened to be suffering from sciatica, and because he could not move, he sent Tomas to the provincial hospital in his place. The town had several hotels, but Tomas happened to be given a room in the one where Teresa was employed. He happened to have had enough free time before his train left to stop at the hotel restaurant. Teresa happened to be on duty and happened to be serving Thomas's table. It had taken six chance happenings to push Tomas towards Teresa, as if he had little inclination to go to her on his own. He had gone back to Prague because of her. So fateful a decision resting on so fortuitous a love, a love that would not even have existed had it not been for the chief surgeon sciatica seven years earlier. And that woman, that personification of absolute fortuity, now again lay asleep beside him, breathing deeply. It was late at night. His stomach started acting up as it tended to do in times of psychic stress. Once or twice her breathing turned into mild snores. Tomas felt no compassion. All he felt was a pressure in his stomach and the despair of having returned. And that is part one. That's all we'll be reading for today. Um, that actually wasn't too bad. I feel like doing it by parts is probably going to be the easiest. I thought I would just... Um... Like stop at random chapters, but I guess doing it with the full, full parts is pretty good. 
Um, let's see. Um, this question of uh, lightness being positive and weight being negative. Um, I do agree that he's like, it could go either way. Um, cause weight, um, I mean, weight has mass and more mass, like positive and weightlessness is zeroed out or negative. Um, um, metaphorically speaking, uh, in terms of like lightness and weight, um, I mean, uh, this book is going to go more into it, but like the lightness of, um, like that freedom that, um, that airiness, um, can be, can be negative for sure. Absolutely. Like being so lost in, um, Like, lost in the clouds is a common expression for it. Um, but even when, like, your own life kind of just feels like, like your, uh, what, what's that other phrase that people use? Like, like a, like a leaf being, um, buffeted by the wind or something like that. Um, lightness could definitely be negative. Weight, weight obviously could also be negative too, being, like, um, struck down or restrained by the weight of, like, responsibility or duty. Um, but weightness being positive could also be like, um, I mean, like, uh, and in terms of like still negative, like you got like the weight of the world on your shoulders and stuff like that. But, um, I'm thinking of weight of like having like, I like, I'm, um, Probably in terms of like being like rooted or um, having a foundation, um, having a weight to your life, like he says in here, does give it purpose too, um, makes it more bearable to live and stuff like that. Uh, but yeah, so yeah, weightness, light, um, lightness, and weight are can both be unbearable. They can also both be very fulfilling. Um, they can both be positive or negative. Um, this passage right here and the one before it too. Um, looking out over the courtyard at the dirty walls, he realized he had no idea whether it was hysteria or love. And he was distressed that in a situation where a real man would instantly have known how to act, he was vacillating and therefore depriving the most beautiful moments he had ever experienced. Um, I would say this idea of like a real man would know what to do or like this idea of like he would know how to act or like people wouldn't be vacillating. That's um, that's a pretty um, insidious <sighs> like preconceived notion of just like having this idea of like, oh, everyone else knows what to do. And I feel like I'm just vacillating. I'm floundering. Um, because oh, I feel like a lot of people, um, especially when they get like real, um, like in their own heads about it, um, do have a hard time. I'm delineating between hysteria and love. And then some people just, like... I feel like some people just live, like, an unexamined life where they don't even, like, contemplate this at all. So that might be, like, the misconception of, like, a real man would instantly have known how to act. It's more like it's... They, it's not like they know how to act. It's like they're not thinking of how to act. They just act. Um... I do like this concept of, like, we can never know what we want because living only one life, we can neither compare it with our previous lives nor perfect it in our lives to come. Yeah, life is like a sketch, I think is what he said. Or, um... It's not exact because a sketch is an outline of something, the groundwork for a picture. 
Whereas the sketch set is our life is a sketch for nothing and outline with no picture. Um, I do like that idea. Um, however, that's only that. And um, I actually wanted to skip the first chapter too because of this idea of like infinite return and um, or infinite recurrence versus... Um, like a flash in the pan, a single, um, single thing. Um, he says, for in this world, everything is parted in advance and therefore everything cynically permitted just because, um, it's meaningless if it has no weight or recurrence to it. Um, I disagree with that only like on a um re religious level i guess just because like this isn't the only world i would say um and so like the sketch that you make in this life like isn't going to become a picture in this life or on this earth i don't think but it's not to say it's not a sketch um for something else um but yeah Mm. if we had only one life to live we might as well not have lived at all yeah i disagree with that um or like this idea of like oh we only have one life to live therefore everything is permitted and we can do what we want because what does he say um i think it was over here Oh, I guess I can't find it. Um, but the passage where he's like all of the um the suffering, the beauty and whatnot, like it's um how can it mean anything if the, the suffering and the beauty is only transitory or just um like exists, like basically his idea of like the a war between um two African kingdoms in the fourteenth century mean nothing because it doesn't affect our lives today. It's like well it did affect the people who lived back then too. But you know, whatever. <laughs> um, also, this idea of like vacillating between, um, like he didn't know if it was love or hysteria and he never made a decision on it. And she kind of just like moved into his life and he accepted it. Like, um, I can relate. I've, I've definitely been there before. Um, just like kind of like almost like going through the motions where it's like you're you don't feel like connected to that person but yeah it's better to uh be with someone and be alone right yeah no that's not that's not true at all but it feels that way for sure um but yeah and also like his vacillating between like she leaves him and he's like heartbroken and wants her back. And then once he like literally the night that he gets back with her, he's like, uh, all he felt was the pressure in his stomach and the despair of having returned. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, dude. Uh, love is something else. Or I guess, uh, I don't know what you would call him, his um, romance or infatuation with um the two other ladies um i forget the names Teresa and sabina um but yeah it's just crazy um this passage too tomas did not realize at the time that metaphors are dangerous metaphors are not to be trifled with a single metaphor can give birth to love and just that idea of like the pitch dog bull rush basket that's you're gonna be seeing that a lot in this story he keeps repeating it um like it's that it's that poetry it's that um that 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 like we 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 take our life when we look at it under the lens of like a narrative or like a, a a story almost and like we give it metaphors and it's just like sometimes like you just like anytime something like bad happens it's like oh what did i do wrong or what does this mean like what am i being punished for this this and that it's like sometimes things just happen 
And like, if you try to give it a metaphor, you're probably gonna like reinterpret it into something it's not. Um, but yeah. Uh, I think that should be all I needed to talk about. Um, oh yeah, the two different uh, versions of compassion. Uh, I thought it was pretty funny, pretty interesting. Uh, but yeah, um, like I said, I think that's everything I needed to go through. Um, so hopefully, I don't know if I want to do this like on a weekly basis. I might upload one, another one, part two, um, next Monday. We'll see. I was thinking about doing like doing this live on a weekly basis, but I just couldn't decide what day I wanted to go live. And also being live is, nah. It's different when you're living with others, and yeah, it's whatever. Um, but yeah, next time, part two, soul and body. This has been the unbearable lightness of being. Thank you, thank you. Have a good night. Check you, check, check, check you out next time. That was a terrible send off. Catch you later. <laughs>